thank you for being here today. I'm Christine Melden, Director of the Center for Social Science Scholarship, which coordinates the Social Sciences Forum Lecture Series. This is our second Distinguished Lecture of the semester, the first one in person, so thank you for being here. And I want to thank the Department of Psychology for organizing it. Before we begin, I want to mention our next lecture, which is on Wednesday, April 5th at 4 p.m. The Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Public Health will host their annual Eckert Lecture on Health and Inequality. Dr. Eric Wright, Distinguished University Professor of Sociology and Public Health and Chair of the Department of Sociology at Georgia State University will present on adverse childhood events, trafficking, and the health of runaway and homeless youth. The event will be held uh, in the library seventh floor. You can find more information on our website, socialscience.nbc.edu. I would also like to invite you to engage with us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all at UMBC Sci. And we also produce a podcast, Retrieving the Social Sciences. So if you want to hear about all that great social science content happening from our um, faculty and student researchers, just tune in. You can find it on Spotify, Apple, or Amazon. Thank you all again for being here, and I will turn things over to Dr. Steve Pitts, Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, you know, being the old person that I am, they have a, uh, I, think it's, I think it's called a power switch. <coughs> if not, mute would also be greatly appreciated. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the jokes only get worse from there. <laughs> so, first off, welcome. I'm, I'm, it's very great to see all of you. As Christine pointed out, um, and this is our first in the psychology department, our first distinguished lecture in person since 2019. And that in and of itself is a, just a wonderful thing to be able to say out loud. So I'm really grateful that you were able to forego this lovely weather to come here when I think it's gonna be a fantastic talk. Um, it's with great pleasure and honor that I introduce to you Dr. Ali Mogadam of Georgetown University. He is the director of the Conflict Resolution Graduate Program in the Department of Government, as well as a professor of psychology. And Dr. Mogadam is a truly multinational scholar. He was born in Iran and subsequently moved to England with his family when he was eight years old. And it was upon earning his PhD in experimental psychology, he's still my husband. Um, from the University of Surrey, he returned to Iran in 1979, almost immediately following the collapse of the Shah's regime. So subsequently, in those next five years of being in Iran, he recognized the true limits of the classic experimental laboratory research model, whilst living in the midst of a radical revolution. Um, he had many formative experiences outside of, and in addition to the traditional pathways of academia, including journalism, as well as working for the United Nations. In 1984, Dr. Mogadam moved to McGill University, so this is now his third country in case you're counting, um, where his recent experiences in Iran began to crystallize and he began a much more in-depth considerations of cultural diversity, cross-cultural psychology, social psychology, and social identity. And in 1990, he left McGill for his fourth country of residence when he transitioned to Georgetown University, where he remains to this day. So as is oft done in these types of introductions, at least the ones I remember, I attempted to obtain the summary numbers, right, that highlight Dr. Mogadam's professional fingerprints. So it, it was remarkably dizzying to try and wrap my head around the touch and the influence that he has had in his storied career. Um, hundreds of articles, hundreds of chapters, dozens of books. I, it's just, it's absolutely amazing. And I know some of you may be aware, I know some other prolific researchers, and, and I'm sure you do. Um, this productivity is arising simultaneously across multiple dimensions. So in areas such as intergroup relations and conflict, Psychology of the Three Worlds, wherein he talks about the consequences as well as reasons for the dominance of American psychology and other social sciences. Uh, positioning theory, human rights and duties, and more broadly, theory and psychology. And as far as I can tell, my, my take home here is that it's possible he's actually three academic professionals, possibly four. I'm not, it, and it, it was quite amazing. Uh, do that search, you'll, you'll get some, some very good insights. 
So I promised there would be bad jokes, so that was picked was the second one. Um, all truth be told, he, he brings multiple methodologies to bear in his research and studies and his understanding of very complex and very critical issues. Um, in keeping with his initial training in experimental methodology, Dr. Mogadam continues uh, to keep experiments as a possible tool, but his experiences and expertise afford him the very clear perspective that reliance on this traditional research methodology is limiting, it's individualistic and reductionist. And so he is able to offer very compelling arguments in favor of a more complete science of behavior moving beyond the, the quote unquote causal model thinking um, and must incorporate much more normatively regulated aspects of behavior. And I, I swear I'm closing soon. Um, actually, I'm gonna skip that paragraph except to say that one of his books is called Shakespeare and the Experimental Psychologist. I mean, this, if you just look at his books, it's like a reading list of your fantasy book club. It's fantastic. Um, we are fortunate to hear Dr. Mogadam today as he presents some of the important and critical points from a recent text, How Psychologists Failed, We Neglected the Poor and Minorities, Favored the Rich and Privileged, and Got Science Wrong, published just last year. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Ali Mogadam. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, when I was invited last year, the idea was to do this talk on Zoom. And I said, look, can we put it off? Because I really love this campus. I was here in the early 90s. And uh, I've come back several times. And one of my close friends through the years, Robert Sapel, uh, was in this department at, in, in, at UMBC. And, and um, uh, he's doing very well, he's back in Africa. So, how psychologists failed, that doesn't sound like a very optimistic title, does it? But I'm gonna to try to end with some optimism. And I'd like to talk for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we can hopefully have a broader discussion. Uh, first of all, for those of you who are not psychologists, psychology is a very important field. <laughs> but it's a field that has changed greatly over the centuries. If we go back to the 19th century, uh, the German experimentalists were at the forefront and they were using introspection. By the end of the 19th century, psychology had re reached a roadblock because some laboratories reported that you could think with images only. Other laboratories said, no, uh, we can think without images. And that controversy actually led to the collapse of this introspective experimental movement. And prepared the way for behaviorism to rise. So you had, at the 20th century, the beginning, a very radical shift. From introspection, you had a shift to behaviorists saying, no, we can only study psychology as a science if we focus on observable behavior. That's the only thing we can do. We must only look at observable behavior. So there was a dramatic shift. Then gradually, psychoanalysis became more and more important in psychology. Freud, Gestalt psychology came along. And by the 1950s, <coughs> cognitive psychology, the study of thinking, was becoming prominent. So we went from behaviorism, which rejected subjective experience, again going back to cognitive psychology, which was focused on thinking. So what I'm pointing out is the history of psychology is full of changes. But there's actually something consistent in all these changes. What is consistent? Two things. One, the causal model, the idea that all human behavior is causally determined. 
that for every behavior there is a cause. Just as when I drop this, it hits the chair, gravity pulls it down, the argument was and is that human behavior is causally determined. That's consistent right across all the schools, including Freud, by the way. Freud was a determinist. He believed that all our behavior is causally determined. I'm gonna challenge that assumption. A second characteristic of psychology throughout all this time has been reductionism. The idea that in order to be a science, we must look at the smallest units possible. And nowadays, through neuroscience, the smallest units are neurons, neural networks, etc. So I'm going to argue that it's time for psychology to make another major shift. First of all, become less reductionist. Second, abandon the idea that all human behavior is causally determined. And I'm gonna argue that actually, we can have a science of psychology which looks at two types of behavior, causally determined behavior and normatively regulated behavior. Now, these two aspects of psychology wouldn't be so important if it wasn't to the fact that they resulted <coughs> in two very important consequences. And these consequences have to do with ideology. It happens to be the case that the reductionism in psychology lines up perfectly with the idea of individual responsibility and self-help. It lines up with the ideology that everybody individually is responsible for their own outcome and we have to rely on self-help. That lineup. Another aspect of this is the causal model particularly where causes are seen to be inside us. And this links up with research on topics like intelligence. You're either intelligent or not, and it's because of what is inside you. That's the idea. So in tackling this set of issues, I uh, crafted this book, how psychologists failed, and the failure is about how we failed to attend to poverty and social class in particular. Now, why is this? Why is poverty and social class neglected in psychology? I don't know if any of you teach general psychology. It's actually my, my favorite course to teach. Pick up one of these glossy $400 books. <laughs> what do you find in them? Well, recently you find ethnicity gets some attention, gender gets some attention, but poverty and social class get no attention. It's as if they don't exist. Why is this? Well, I think it has to do with the ideology that pervades the United States. I think it has to do with the Cold War. The idea that in the United States, we reject anything to do with socialism. And of course, uh, social class, if you talk about social class, you must be a socialist. And if you're concerned about poverty, oh, you must be a lefty of some radical kind. That ideology has pervaded psychology. And it very much is the case that if you look at mainstream general psychology texts, what we introduce students to in psychology, 
that neglect of poverty and social class is there. Now, another aspect of this is the power of the United States globally. It wouldn't matter so much if psychology in some small country neglected poverty and social class. But it happens to be the case that the United States is the superpower of psychology. This is, uh, I, I wrote about this back in the 80s, well before the collapse of the Soviet Union. The US has been the powerhouse of psychology at least for the last half century, maybe more, maybe more. Uh, if you go back to the history of psychology, in the 1917 so, uh, revolution, when the Soviets came into power, the Soviets, in order to create the new communist person, what did they do? They looked to American psychology. They looked to behaviorism to try to shape the new Soviet person. So US psychology has been dominant for a long time. US psychology gets exported to the second world of psychology, which is the rest of the industrialized world, and it gets exported to the third world. I'll tell you a story about myself. I was in Iran after the revolution, and um, uh, there was the so-called Cultural Revolution, which was basically a copy of what Mao did. Very similar processes, Mao and Khomeini, old men, encouraging very radical young men to attack the universities and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that, that was a pattern they followed. And then they said to me, well, you're going to have to do something other than just teach because you, you, you're going to be outside the university now. So I said, okay, I'll write a social psychology text that will be taking up what I call the normative model as well as the caudal model. They looked at my proposal and they said no. Basically, they didn't trust me. They said, we can't trust this person to write any book. I left, ended up coming to Canada at McGill and then here I wrote the social psych text I have in mind. What happened was they translated into Farsi. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because, oh, it's, it's published in America. It must be good. <coughs> Unfortunately, most of the third world is teaching textbooks that are 30 years out of date from America. Some of the texts you teach here, you can find them much cheaper in the third world. They're photocopied. The power of the US in influencing psychology is tremendous. That's why it matters that we here have neglected poverty. That's why it matters. Now, You all have this, I hope. If you don't, please, uh, there's lots more of these. Um, you'll see on the second page, I list cognition and decision-making, intelligence, personality, motivation, mental health, justice. These are some issues <coughs> that we psychologists study, but we completely ignore the power of poverty as a context. We ignore social class, cognition and decision making. Well, we know that cognitive load is very much affected by context. We know that when we give young people tests, decision making tests, if we bring in issues about money, kids who are poorer, they're going to do worse in the test. We know this from standardized testing as well. For example, there's uh, what I go through in my book is examples of research where you give a young person an instance, 
a scenario where there's a car that needs repair. When the car needs repair and they have to work out some sums, if the car needs repair and the, the amount of money is high, the person who's poorer does worse in that job. They do worse in the task. Why? Because the, the, they feel the pressure immediately. Oh, $2,000 for repair, what am I gonna do? If you happen to be rich, you don't care. One of my favorite research pieces in this where I go through the book is done in a sugar, sugar cane area in India where they tested farmers before and after harvest. Before a harvest, they had less money. When they tested them, they did less well than after harvest when they had money. There's a lot of excellent research now being done, and, and by the way, this book is dedicated to researchers who are now coming through working on social class and poverty and psychology. There's excellent research showing that the context of poverty impacts cognitive processes. It's very basic. Similarly on intelligence. What's the best predictor of scores on intelligence tests right now? Income. Very simple. You can predict very well where most students will end up going to college. How? Look at the parents' income. There are all kinds of strategies that people with money use in order to help their kids, and that's fine. They should do that. But shouldn't we also be providing the same possibilities for people who are poor? In some ways, we've been going backwards because even in countries where it used to be the case that money mattered less, it's happening the other way now. Uh, when I went to university in England, even as a foreigner, as long as I got the grades, I didn't pay any tuition. No tuition. Now, it doesn't matter what grades you get, you have to pay and the tuition has shot up. So what's happening right now is at the global level, there is wealth concentration. If you look up Oxfam estimates, it's very interesting. The number of individuals it takes, something like 25 now, to have enough wealth to match half the world's population. About 25 people own as much wealth as half the world's population. Wealth concentration is increasing. At the same time, higher education is becoming more and more money-based. And at the same time, we psychologists are ignoring the impact of poverty and social class. So, as I said, there is a positive side to this because there are now a group of psychologists who are attending to this and their research is really showing the power of economic inequalities, the context of, powerful, uh, of poverty. Personality, another topic I, I discuss in the text. I distinguish between traditional personality research, which I call micro-personality, and what I call e-personality or extended personality. I talk about social class and personality. Think about something like extroversion. Think about something like neuroticism. These personality characteristics we treat as if the individual is mobile, independent, and isolated. That's not the case if you are poor and working in certain jobs. Invisibility is your main characteristic. 
You are invisible. You can't be an extrovert. Why? Because that is the privilege of somebody who has power and status. So the context of personality becomes important. Personality is not something isolated from context. Motivation, another very important topic. We think about motivation and of course we relate it to success as being dependent on individual effort, linking it to individualism and saying anyone can make it. <coughs> anyone can make it. The American dream is still there. Well, motivation is not something independent of context again. Putnam has pointed out, he's, this is Putnam who wrote about bowling alone, he's also written about children and growing up, Robert Putnam, he, who retired. He writes about inheritance, and he's very insightful. Inheritance. Think about inheritance. We typically think about, oh, uh, inheriting part of a house or inheriting some shares. But Patnam says, no, inheritance is a lot more than that. I have a test in my book that I call the lawyer test. What do I mean? Somebody says, I want to become a lawyer. And you ask them, well, okay, do you know any lawyers? Do you know any judges? And if I ask students here and uh, many other places, I'm sure you will know lawyers and judges. You might say yes. Uh, my neighbor is a judge. Uh, my, my, I have a nephew who's married to a lawyer, that kind of thing. Well, I've done research with kids who say, yeah, I, 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 my dad was in jail and he got a lawyer assigned to him. And when I was arrested, I, they, they told me about, I could have a lawyer. It's a very different perspective on wanting to become a lawyer and what you know. Um, I've done research with immigrants who, when you ask them, uh, what do you want your children to be? They immediately say, oh, uh, doctor, lawyer. Okay, what do they have to do to get there? No clue, no clue. And in that house, while you're interviewing them, there's nowhere to sit where anybody could have any quiet. There's a difference in inheritance here, and it's got a lot more to do than just the part of a house or shares you inherit. It has to do with the social networking that is coming down to you. Mental health, another of the topics I discuss. Now, again, one of the links that we've been missing has been the relationship between poverty and mental health. It is a fact, it is an empirical fact that there is a strong link between poverty and mental health. And what bothers me is the new positive psychology movement where one of the implications seems to be just think positive. Just think positive. Be happy. Well, is that a solution? And actually, when you dig into their research, they themselves report in several places, which I quote in the book, that actually poverty links up with mental health. And it's no good telling people, feel happy, be happy. That is not the solution. It seems to me to be a very superficial way to go. <clears throat> and finally, justice, another topic I discuss in the text, uh, 
in a chapter titled something like Looking Through the Wrong Side of Prisons, Prison Bars. One of the characteristics of American society is that we put a lot of people behind bars, over two million at the moment. Enormous cost, enormous cost, human cost, material cost. And part of the prison system is privatized and much of the prison system is profitable. They make profit out of the prison system in all kinds of ways. Does it do any good? Not in the least. It's not a reform system. Who is in prison? Of course, we have lots of statistics about, yes, there are more ethnic minorities in prison, etc., etc. But people forget the basic fact that poor people are in prison. Poor white people are in prison. If you're a rich white person, you're not going to end up in that prison. It is the poor that end up in prison. That's what's common to them. The poor blacks, the poor Hispanics, the poor whites. In some of my writings in the last 15 years, I've been writing about psychology of dictatorship and democracy. And this puzzle of why it is that so many poor white people vote for somebody like Trump. They did, and they have, and they continue to support him. Why do they do that? Well, because they see the mainstream is letting them down. What is the mainstream doing for them? Nothing. If I were a poor white, I'd probably vote, vote for Trump. He's the only one promising anything. So there is a problem here. The problem is not going to be solved by us dismissing Trump because he is just a symptom. Underneath that, there's much more serious things. So I think what I'm asking for is disciplines like psychology to reorient themselves. And at the root of the problem with psychology is, as far as I can see, reductionism trying to reduce explanations to smaller and smaller units. And now we have this focus on the neuron, neural networks, etc. And the second part being this focus exclusively on the causal model. Now, the causal model has many problems that we refuse to look at. For example, if human behavior is causally determined, how can there be sin? Sin doesn't make any sense. The churches should just close down. <laughs> if the causal model is actually taking place, how can there be guilt in the law courts? If my behavior is causally determined by factors outside me or inside me and I'm not in control, how can there possibly be guilt in the courthouse? So there's some very fundamental issues that we sidestep. We refuse to tackle directly. Beside that, in our everyday lives, we assume causation to some degree. For example, if I uh, play tennis, which I do very badly, if I play tennis and I hit myself on the head with a racket and I, I lose memory, of, and, and I, well, that's causal. The knock on the head caused neural damage. It was a causal effect. But, that's only one type of behavior. That's only one type of behavior. Most of the time, our behavior is regulated by normative systems. 
we do the right thing in context, we follow norms and rules most of the time, but we have intentionality and we could decide to do something else. For example, thank you for joining us. It's a nice day out there. You have the free will to go out again, right? You yeah. could join the sun, right? you see? <laughs> but you won't because you're too polite. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm gonna stop, I'll summarize and have a discussion. To begin with, I started by pointing out that the history of psychology is the history of change. We've shifted from the introspective movement in the 19th century to behaviorism, to cognitive psychology. Now we're going into more and more micro neuro processes. We've shifted all along. But throughout these shifts, there have been two consistencies. One is We've assumed causation in human behavior. We've assumed that there's only one type of behavior and it's causal. And I would argue actually human behavior is of two types, causally determined and normatively regulated. And I believe we have some measure of intentionality. That's the first point. Second point is that we have remained reductionist and this has consequences. One of the consequences is we have ignored very important topics like poverty and social class. And if you look at the psychological research that is beginning to take off now, and I, and I map some of this psychological research in my book, if you look at that psychological research, it's clear that poverty and social class have a direct and powerful impact on cognition, on intelligence, on motivation, on all the psychological processes that are central to our behavior. So I think we need a shift, and fortunately, we're getting to that shift, and I'm sure that uh, particularly the young people here, you're gonna help move this ship along. Thank you, I'll stop there. Like me to just please okay. I mean, like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I can moderate. So. I don't have a question. I was looking for you all. <laughs> yes. Sure, I'll give it a go to start. Um, so I'm a little bit of an interloper because I'm an anthropologist. But can you say a little bit more about what you see as the difference between saying something's not causal and that it's caused by normative regulation with intentionality. They sound both like different kinds of explanations of cause. In traditional psychology, we use the experimental method, and most psychologists are trained to do this in the lab as I was trained, we manipulate independent variables to measure the effect of that manipulation on the dependent variable. Okay. And we assume that independent is the cause, dependent is the effect, just as gravity causes <coughs> this to drop, I can monitor the link between independent and dependent and say there's causation. What I'm saying is that some types of behavior fit that model. For example, I gave the example of me getting a bang on the head, neural damage, loss of memory. That I would say is causal in the same way as gravity pulling down this paper. 
That's what in the old philosophies they would call efficient causation. Efficient causation. Now what is normatively regulated behavior? Oh, by the way, I didn't ask you how you are today. How are you doing? <laughs> okay, pretty good. Okay, pretty good. You could have said mind your own business. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you? So the, my understanding of what would happen if I did that would be that it wouldn't be great. And so isn't that a cause? Ah, no. Norms are not causes. Sure, norm's not a cause. I didn't say the norm. My understanding of the norm, my anticipation, my anxiety, right. aren't those causes? Those are all regulating what you do, but you have a choice. Let me use so another example. Deterministic causes are the kinds of causes you're talking about. There's a distinction between efficient causation, where X always leads to Y, and normatively regulated behavior where you follow patterns of behavior such as we're all sitting facing this way. Why? That's what we do in this kind of setting. Do you have to do that? No. One of you could decide I've had enough of this, I'm gonna go and stand right next to it. You could do that. You could do that. Why don't you do that? Well, because that's not the norm in this context. That's not correct behavior. And we know this when we travel to new countries, right? When we go somewhere, for example, um, if you go to Japan, I always get mixed up because they, they put the slippers for the washroom, then the slippers for this, and I, I don't know which one I'm using, and, but I have to try to follow the rules. So there's a difference between normatively regulated behavior and efficient causation, where you do not have any kind of intentionality in that process. Now, one of the problems, limitations in psychology is that we've just assumed one type of behavior. And we've done that because we've assumed that in order to be a science, that's how we have to go. By the way, the, the book Shakespeare and the Experimental Psychologist argues that the roots of experimental psychology are much earlier than the 19th century. You could actually find experiments in Shakespeare's plays, and that's what I did in that book. Shakespeare has experiments in his plays with controls, with independent and dependent variables, he has brilliant experiments. Sorry, can I ask a follow-up question? Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. Like, thinking about the, the two types of behavior that you are defining, like, I actually cannot think of a psychology research that look at an outcome that's like totally determined. We always have options. I just think on top of my head, okay, uh, do you have a friend next to you and you are cheating on the exam, that's a classic experiment. They always have a choice to cheat or not. And there's, it's always percentage. It's not like you have a friend with you, you're going to cheat. Or you, have, you don't have a friend with you, you're not going to cheat. It's never like X leads to Y. In human behavior, I feel everything sort of was under the norm to regulate it. Can you give me an example of like the, because the vacancy is more, I don't know, physical or, you know. Right. Uh, th that's an excellent point you make. First point that in the psychology experiments that we undertake, it's usually normatively regulated. Even if you think of the classic experiments like Milgram, okay, 65% do this. It's not 100%. That's the first point. Second point, are there examples of behavior where it is efficient causation? Yes, I think in areas like perception, perception is a very important topic for psychology, there's lots of examples of efficient causation. How we see color, for example. Uh, lots of studies on single cells 
and perception. So I think that they're mostly in the area that we would call physiological. But as soon as you bring in norms to the situation, it becomes, I think, not causally determined in the efficient causation way. As, because as soon as you have a choice, and you can see a choice, then it becomes normative. However, see, we, if you look at standard psychology texts, particularly research methodology, they talk about things like, and I, I, again, I quote this in my text. They say, well, in, in physics, this is how it's done. In biology, this is how it's done. And in psychology, this is what we do as well. <clears throat> well, are we studying the same things? If, if some biochemist is encapsulating an enzyme, that enzyme is very different from a human being. That enzyme you can deal with with efficient causation. That enzyme does not have uh, the ability to reflect on itself, as far as I know. So that that that's an important distinction. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. That was excellent. Um, I'm wondering if you ever address or bring up scientific paradigms, because to me it sounds like what you're, what you're critiquing is a positivist paradigm where there's like a single objective reality that we can always understand through experimentation, but as we know, humans are not, they don't fit that model. Um, we're very complex, we're, we're varied in experience and subjectivity, so I'm wondering if you speak to any like paradigmatic shifts that need to happen um, or just talk about scientific paradigms more in your in your work thank you for that question yes the, the, the subtitle for this book is how we got science wrong mm -hmm. and um, unfortunately my friend Ram Hare has passed away I was working on this book when he was alive he was a philosopher of science and we did a book together on causation. I'm convinced that psychology has adopted the wrong model of causation in science. And it, but, but what I was trying to point out at the beginning is that this is not the first time. If you go back to our history, we started with introspection. And the whole idea that individuals can be trained in the laboratory to the report of what's going on here, that process. Then we went radically different. We're, we're actually very radical people, we psychologists. <laughs> you know, at the end of the 19th century, we threw out introspection and said, no, no, no. Don't even look at subjective behavior anymore. The behaviorist, J.B. Watson, 1913 manifesto, only look at objectively observable behavior. We've gone 100% the other way, or 180%. So what did we do? We shifted. Then we had a period when we were enamored by Freud and irrationality. Then we came back in the 1950s with the computer revolution. We went with cognition. And now we're going more and more towards cognitive neuroscience and neuroscience. We are radicals in a way. We, we make these radical shifts. And at the moment, the neuroscience tradition is taking off, but we're making false assumptions. Uh, there's a wonderful book called The Philosophical Foundations of Neuroscience. Neuroscientists never read this. Never. <laughs> but in that book, uh, it has a discussion about what's called the Mariological fallacy. The Mariological fallacy. The Mariological fallacy is when you attribute the properties of wholes to parts. Let me give you an example. A student came to see me recently. Um, her grand, 
mother had died and she was, what, she was going home. And I expressed condolences to her. Now, I know that if we do a brain scan, her amygdala would be very active. Why? Because that's sort of center of emotional activity, etc. Was I expressing condolences to her amygdala? <laughs> no. Why? Because she as a person is sad. You know, there's a whole field of research right now on embodied cognition, embodied cognition. Cognition doesn't just happen in one part of the brain. It's true that if you destroy the amygdala, emotions are disrupted. If you destroy my hypothalamus, my eating disorders will spring up. But that doesn't mean that when I feel hungry, only my hypothalamus is hyperactive. It means that I as a person am hungry. So we tend to go towards that reductionism where we pick on something and we say, oh look, that part of the brain is lighting up. That explains why this person is sad. No, this person is sad because her grandmother has passed away. She as a person is sad and I'm expressing condolences to her as a person. I'm not saying to her, I feel bad for your amygdala. <laughs> of interest to continue this topic. When you said that poverty is a completely different context that impacts people and development, I immediately thought about how, for example, just a sim such something, something as simple as malnourishment can also impact it. So I think, I'm just curious, do you think that uh, this, for example, neuroscientific point of view will continue into something biological? When we include poverty in the conversation, it will still be oh, this person didn't eat enough, that's why he does that on an IQ test. I see what you mean, yes, yes. That is a danger, but the research being done on issues like food insecurity, food insecurity, is showing that people who experience food insecurity have impaired cognition not just because they haven't eaten enough, because they are insecure. The anxiety raised by the fact that this mother doesn't know if she's gonna be able to feed her children over the next two days. That food insecurity, and by the way, food insecurity has increased on campuses. And it it's impacts performance. So food insecurity isn't just the fact that biologically you're lacking food, it's the fact that you're, you're anxious, you're stressed because you don't know where you're gonna get your next meal from. And that impacts cognitive performance. Yes. Sorry, I was just, so when you talk about n normative pieces, I'm also wondering how that squares with systems of oppression because I think that they inform one another, but I'm also not sure like, if it's a chicken egg or, or one or two that, yeah. Well, there are very good research themes right now linked to this. Uh, for example, there's a whole area under system justification the whole idea that norms regulate our behavior, well, where do the norms come from? Uh, do I have the same influence as Rupert Murdoch in creating norms? No. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, a concentration of wealth in the world at the moment. We have about 25 people who own as much wealth as half the world's population, that's 3.5 billion and more. Someone like Rupert Murdoch, through his extensive communication ownership, owning Fox News, etc., etc., he can influence, he can regulate behavior in a way that I can't. 
So very much the case that norms are not influenced equally by different people. Uh, there's a concentration of power at the moment. Now, how do we change this concentration? Uh, how do we get to a more equal situation? That's a tricky question. Um, there's a, a wonderful book called The Great Leveler. I, I, I've forgotten the um, author. But his argument basically is that the only time you're going to get a redistribution of wealth from this situation is through gigantic war. It's only in wartime that the wealthy, the truly wealthy, are become ready to have a redistribution of wealth because they realize everything's collapsing anyway. But the argument is that if there isn't enormous warfare, and if the system continues, the concentration of wealth continues. <coughs> I hope that's not the case, but that's his argument. Thank you very much. So um, in psychology, you know, we talk a lot about biological, psychological, social, and sociocultural influences on behavior. We talk about Bronson Brenner's ecological systems theory. Would you mind comparing and contrasting some of those perspectives with the new kind of um, material that you're presenting in your book and how it does or doesn't converge with that? What I'm doing is highlighting a theme that's been continuous in the history of psychology. I'm arguing that if you go across the different schools of psychology, they've all adopted the causal model. The only one that hasn't is humanistic psychology. That's the only one that hasn't. So if you look at the developmental models, Bromfield, Barrows, et cetera, et cetera, the research undertaken is still adopting the causal model. And what I'm saying is that that model is not enough. We need to have a focus on an alternative type of behavior, which is not explained by causation, efficient causation, so that needs to focus on normative regulation. And that leads us to all kinds of questions about, well, where do norms come from? How do they take shape? Who has the power to shape norms? And that, that leads us into all kinds of discussions about power structure. The second issue is reductionism. And Fortunately, I think particularly developmental psychologists are doing much better work now. Uh, they are going beyond the traditional reductionist model. So I think uh, if you look at the way community psychology, developmental psychology, these areas are developing, I think they're doing much better work that's going beyond traditional reductionism. However, uh, we need to do better. There's a lot of work in developmental psychology in um, the power of context and poverty on early childhood. This is great, and that's what we need to build on. Uh, I think in some areas of psychology, I think we've done much better. Yeah. Um, can I also follow sure. up a little bit on that? I totally agree with like advocacy and everything, but. The, the reality is the, well, I'll use your term, the effective causality, like studies following that pattern, you know, assimilates uh, physics, chemistry, and all that. They got funded, they get like endorsed, because they give people certain answers, right? They seem to be solving problems in the longer term. Okay, people are sad. We maybe give a shot there, and they, they stop being sad. Right. Whereas for us, we'll have to, okay, contact, childhood adversity, yeah. all that kind of thing, you know, you can't do anything about that. So, 
the field is moving that way because money is flowing that way, so that is going that way. People want that way. Whereas we are emphasizing our side, like environmental, uh, you know, a researcher by training. But how do we, you know, advocate and make the shift where we are under resourced and we don't have the, you know, convincing stuff to appeal people to come to our side? Because yes. like we studied these facts, but there's no immediate effects of our study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, psychology has always been influenced by larger social factors and political factors. Um, you know, why is it that American psychology is the most influential in the world? Is it because, in terms of scientific criteria, it's the best? I don't think that's the only thing. I think it's very good, but the fact that America is the military superpower is very important as well. So psychology comes along with that background. If you go back again to the history of psychology, how did the behaviorists win out? If we think logically about what they were saying, it was idiotic. They were saying, exclude all thinking and subjective experience from psychology. Now that seems idiotic and obviously so. How did they become dominant for 50 years? They had technology. The Skinner box and the classical conditioning, the operant conditioning, all of that was very powerful. It was a new technology, new language, as I explained, it even affected the communists. The communists tried to adopt it to create the new Soviet person. Technology is always going to have a lot of influence. Why is neuroscience gaining influence? Because it has technology. Um, I can write a grant on any social psychological phenomenon it might be for $300,000. If I add scanning, I can double the number. <laughs> Do I need scanning? No. Why not add the number? Add the money. <laughs> so that's the practical issue. Okay. <laughs> on that positive uptick that he, he promised us to just add scanning to your grants. We you probably have time for one more question. Or is this there? Just add scanning. Yes. Hi, I, I'm not a psychologist, so but I was intrigued by the title, and I wanted to come listen to it. I was just curious what you might um, ponder. What the reason is that the research doesn't go had not been uh, focused on the poverty issues, like like the gentleman over there talking about the practical issues of funding and technology and what you said. I'm just wondering if you. What your thoughts, I mean, you know, in a nutshell. I think there's multiple factors. There's no doubt in my mind that one of the factors is the background of the Cold War. And um, what happens in politics? Just think about the worst thing a politician can be called, a socialist. You know, the, the whole issue of social class and poverty is linked to that, which, which is idiotic. Poverty must be a concern for everybody. I think that's part of it, the political background. A second background, I think, is it just hasn't been sexy. <laughs> you know, if, if I say to somebody, I'm going to study... Um, problem-solving and poverty, yeah. oh, you know, that's not too exciting. I mean, what's that? If I say um, I'm going to study problem-solving and um, high-stake investors, gosh, well, that's exciting. Are you going to go to Wall Street? What are you going to do? You know, so it, it's just the topic not being really up there. 
Um, we need some kind of sex appeal for poverty. As was pointed out, each and every one of you had a choice to be here, and I'm glad you made what I consider to be the right choice. Thank you. Thank you very much.